everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Reading Party Podcast with Megan and Lexi. This episode continues our season looking at modern retellings of the Iliad and the Odyssey, ancient epics known for both brutal violence and instances of sexual assault. This episode is not suitable for under 18s. We hope you have your favourite beverage and snack ready to go, because we've got our teas and are ready to start spilling the tea on our latest ancient story. Welcome back to the reading party. Today we're doing the second half of Margaret George's Helen of Troy. Before we get into that though, Lexi, I think you're drinking chamomile. I assume chamomile is necessary. Chamomile is very necessary because I I don't know, like I know a lot of people use it for like going to bed. Mm. Um, but there's something about chamomile where it just feels good on my throat and then mm. if i like put a little honey and lemon in it um like yeah even just using my throat from overuse like i'll just have this kind of tea and then i'm like oh my god it's amazing mm -hmm. the world is a brighter world place now much brighter place <laughs> yeah exactly uh what are you drinking excellent i have orange spice tea and it's orange and spice. I assume there's some kind of cardamom or something in there, but it's very tasty. And I'm trying to decrease my caffeine intake. I don't think I drink problematic amounts, but I drink more tea than I do just plain water. So I'm trying to have essentially flavored water. You're, you, so Stop biting it. You're so British. I know, like, I know. It's a, it's like, a thing. You, you, you just gotta admit, like Brits drink a, a ridiculous yeah. amount of tea, so <laughs> it doesn't surprise me that you're like, oh yes, I have no. way more tea than I do water. Yes, and it, it, I did recently find that um, apparently tea does count as like my water intake, which is really nice. But I felt I should probably have a little bit more variety mm. i don't know it's tasty though so i'm i'm oh, happy yeah <laughs> which is hey that's good i just it's all good you know I, I i tried to get into like this flavor watered thing i tried to get into like a Lacroix type of situation mm -hmm. i just can't though like i just can't um you know mm. so you know <laughs> Well, tea, tea will, tea will just have to sustain us both. Um, we should talk about the second half, yes, of Helen of Troy, which, as I've said, is is a massive book. Um, it's not quite big enough to like kill someone, as some of my academic volumes are, but it's a pretty substantial book. How did the second half fare for you? Do you feel like it redeemed the disappointments we had in the first? I don't know if I would say it redeemed it, but I think it was more. I don't. I don't want to say like a bit more compelling, but at the same time, it included stuff that like I wasn't sure if it would make it in there. I mean, like okay, maybe. I, like I just don't. I, I I was very confused because the the first half of my version um, included a lot of stuff that canonically we've learned is true, but I just wasn't expecting it to mm. to make it in because there there is a lot of stuff. Mm. Um, so because like when I think we read to chapter thirty eight up to chapter thirty eight uh, last time, yes, roughly the breakdown. Yeah. Um, and so like when it picked up. I was already going in like, okay, I'm like resigned to the second half. Well, let's go. And then it picks up with this recounting of Helen getting to Troy and like them going to see Oinoni, you know? And I was like, 
am I mm-hmm. reading Natalie Haynes version suddenly? Like what? Yeah. And you, you have this whole thing where she's like, yeah, I want to go visit Oinoni and I want to see your life. I want to, I want to, and she's like very curious. And I was like, okay, this is going somewhere. I'm, it's getting better. Um, and so, yeah, it, mm-hmm. it has like that episode. It had the Polyxena episode. It, it had her, it had Paris strangely recounting the contest, which I don't remember being a thing in previous adaptations. He doesn't tell anyone. We, like, y- you see mm-hmm. it happen. And and then that you're just like, oh, okay, it's, it's a thing. It happened, and that's how we got here. And then he, like, actually, like, tells Helen. And you're like, oh, okay, well, he, he really told her everything. And, I mean, I suppose it, it would have been expected that, like, she might have known. He might have been like, this is how we fell in love. Or this is, I mean, that actually makes it worse to, to, to tell her mm-hmm. that, like you are here causing my city grief because of the gods and it wasn't your choice and and like that would have actually kind of validated any confused mm-hmm. feeling she had over why am i in troy why am i here when she goes through this like thing right where she like has a moment yeah. of conscience and is like i'm causing your city so much pain i maybe shouldn't be here why am I here? And then, yeah, so it kind of validated it. But, um, so it was like an interesting choice. But I suppose at this point, if she's already here, you would want to just have full transparency. Um, anyway, but yeah, so we, we had those, um, uh, interesting, um, additions, which I didn't think would make it, which, would ma- which made it more compelling, I suppose, for me. But then it really sort of follows the path of, a normal trajectory of the Iliad. I mean, you, you get the recounting of the war. Although I think the, well, the, the portrayal of Achilles is kind of similar to Helen of Troy. Cause you know, I found him to be not like sort of yeah laudable hero who was struck with tragedy. He's portrayed here as like this violent, brute you know just just force of brutality and 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 roughness and stuff and then um you know i guess Mm -hmm. i expected it from helen if when she's like looking back at like paris he's not he's not this childish like hot shot he's totally like walking into something it's in over his head because he's so young um she's like no he's all heroic and noble and he kills achilles the invincible and he's now redeemed himself because his aged father is like you know expecting things i don't know um yeah it was just interesting and i suppose um you know the the war stuff is maybe it's because we've been through it so much but i was kind of like okay war stuff cool trojan war blah 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 interesting perspective and then i kind of enjoyed sort of the very end where through helen's eyes when when we watch like prime and, and hecuba sort of succumb to this great despair over the, the the falling of their city um and and you know it, i don't know it's it's interesting because then we get yet another version of paris's death um in this version he like gets an infection from a very minor wound and then it kills him because he gets like it was a poisoned arrow though i think Uh, right right it's so long little details either way i'm like okay well he gets like a wound but then he dies of sepsis right Mm. and then you're like okay sure which is funny because i was like well in fall of a city which was so beautifully done um, I mean, Menelaus just kind of marches in there and is like, okay, Prince Alexander, I know you die. And mm-hmm. then he just stabs him and then he just kind of like heroically spreads out on the bed and dies. And this one I'm like, LOL, sepsis is such a worse way to go. I think I'd actually just take the knife right to my like abdomen or whatever it was mm-hmm. that just killed him. Um, yeah, and then I guess the 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 twist at the end in this one, in in my version at least, um, did yours end with Paris's brother Deophobus, um, like trying to get Helen to marry him as a nod to Trojan custom? So in in my version, they they got married. Okay, no, they they do get married in this one. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just interesting because I was like, really, he's like 
now he's like, okay, my brother's dead, so now you should marry me. So apparently that is actually canon, because I was so surprised I googled oh, it. Oh, okay, cool. And it looks like in the mythology that sprung up around Helen, this is canon. She marries Diphobus, and obviously then is eventually taken back to Troy. Why, why did you... So for those joining us and did not listen to last week's episode uh lexi listens to the audiobooks i read the paperbacks and apparently for this particular novel for some unknown reason they diverge in some places so we're not entirely sure we're reading the same story did yours carry on past the fall of troy um i'm trying to think wait okay i because mine has a whole like three chapters that they go to egypt for seven years and then they go home to sparta and she's reunited with hermione and then ultimately she she comes back to Troy after the death of Menelaus. Yes, actually, because I'm remembering, because I also, f- full disclosure, it was so long and I and I listened to this a couple days ago that I was like, oh my God, I don't remember the end. So I did le- listen to the last like two chapters uh, this morning again, just to make sure I, I knew what was going on. Um, yeah, she comes back and she the, the entire last chapter is like a 15 minute segment where she's just describing like the shock, the pure shock of coming back to Troy and um i mean she's just like oh my gosh this is very shocking um and then she kind of describes what i I thought to be like an inner monologue of like just memories of remembering what happened um because i remember she places a whole lot of um like uh, there's a uh, there's there's a lot of time spent in the last like five minutes of her being like flashbacking through uh, like her interactions with paris and then here she is like being like i want to open my eyes i want to do this and then she's like no there's a ghostly presence around me um telling me to like keep my eyes closed because i'm here and then she's like there's some like ghostly touch or whatever and then it like fades off because she's like i'm i'm here i'm here paris you know and i was like this is a lot of time spent on this what would normally be like one moment but i was like okay you do you um but yeah yeah it was um yeah it was very interesting i was i was not expecting that okay good we did we did ultimately read the same book then which is always helpful for a book discussion podcast yeah i'm like it seemed like part two there was less deviation and i don't know why because i'm like i definitely and i'm like well the, the the four children thing never really came up again ever so i'm like why include this detail of her four children if you're not gonna do anything with that but i was like cool you do you yeah i don't know i but also i feel like there's less opportunity in terms of deviation in the second half because it becomes so formulaic in the in the form of you know the trojan war like there's only so much you can really do that you know i actually i really enjoyed the second half i wasn't expecting to but i found and helen still as a character doesn't feel terribly special or impressive but i did find looking at the trojan war from within the walls exclusively and how it focuses on things like the rise and fall of Paris and Helen's relationship because when Troilus dies, when Troilus is killed by Achilles, then Paris kind of retreats into himself and he and and Helen, they don't split up, but they start sleeping in separate rooms, which is a huge thing because they deliberately constructed their palace with only one bedroom. And she, she recounts how alone she feels and how he's essentially become a stranger to her and they're only really reconciled when Aphrodite whisks him off from the battlefield and you get the sense that it's Aphrodite who kind of prods Paris back into present reality again so I found that relationship more interesting actually than I thought I did and much more interesting than I've ever found it in other adaptations of the Trojan War the two of them felt it felt much more like a real relationship that has ups and downs and at some points it's really bad and at some points it's absolutely amazing and it was really nice to see that development and to see them as more rounded characters and less star-crossed lovers trope 
So I enjoyed that. I did also enjoy the changing relationship between Helen and the rest of the Trojans, because at the beginning of the war, everyone in Troy is very much gung-ho and enthusiastic, and there's a bunch of young men who are just really, really excited about finally getting to go and, and prove their heroism and, and all this stuff. And the common people are shouting about Helen, about how Helen is their Greek treasure and they'll never give her up. And it's wonderful and lovely. And the royal family aren't super thrilled about her, but, you know, they tolerate her and it's okay. Um, but then as it progresses, and you don't really get a sense of how long it goes on because it's just, there's, she does a really good job of like the grinding monotony of just siege warfare. But as it progresses, people get less and less and less happy about Helen being there. And she starts to feel more and more as though she's being blamed which I think is, is reasonable and probably if this had actually happened, would have been very true to life. So that was, that was very interesting. And especially after Hector dies, she makes a point of saying that Hector really was the only person in the family outside of Paris who made a point of speaking to her and of not blaming her for the war. And after he dies, even Andromache kind of shuts herself off and they'd kind of, they'd been friends previously. So that was, I thought it was very well done. And then after Paris dies, it's like she's completely fucked. She has to marry um, Diophobus and she doesn't want to. But luckily her her slave woman, not really a slave woman, the woman, the seer who came with her from Sparta has this super cool um, like poison that if you if you get scratched by it, you are unable to have an erection. So, and it just lasts forever. So after she can't put him off any longer, she makes up this fake Spartan marriage ritual. And is like, I have to, like, we have to do this to be married in my eyes as well as your eyes. And he's like, sure, sure, sure. Whatever. As long as I get to have sex with the afterwards, that's all cool. So she ends up scratching him with this thorny bush. That's got this poison covered over it. And then like, makes up a bunch of prayers to um to Hera to sanctify their marriage bed and then when she thinks maybe the poison's had enough time to to work she's like all right then come on let, let's let's get this over with and he just yeah doesn't work and never works after that so he just stops bothering her which i i was pleased about because he is someone that throughout the whole of the novel is creepy and gross and makes her very very uncomfortable and when she had to marry him i was just not looking forward to any of that rape essentially but it didn't happen so i was i was very relieved um yeah so i enjoyed i enjoyed those mm -hmm. developing relationships and, and seeing everything because um Troy Fall of a City obviously did that. You see the siege from inside the city. But I feel as though, because this is so much focused on Helen, obviously it's a, a first-person narration, you get a lot more of the inner workings of her and how she feels and all the individual relationships that she's um, caught up in. So it was... Yeah, I, I enjoyed it far more than I was anticipating. And I did also enjoy getting so much story after the fall of the city. That was enjoyable. And you get to hear about, you don't see all of it, obviously, but you get to hear about what happens to Agamemnon and Cassandra and Creusa, not Creusa, Creusa is Aeneas' husband. There are too many C names. Clytemnestra. And I liked that they had to spend, what, seven years in Egypt. They get blown off course, spend seven years in Egypt, which is cool because it speaks to one of the later tradi traditions where Helen is actually in Egypt for the whole of the Trojan War. So that was that was nice. And, pa and Menelaus, actually, when they're leaving, says something to the effect of, it's as though you never went to Troy. You were in Egypt this whole time, and I just came and rescued you, and now we're going home. And Helen's like, oh, well, that's how he's dealing with it. Fair enough. Um, oh, and while in Egypt, she gets this super exciting potion that essentially just dulls all of her emotions. So she doesn't have to feel the pain and trauma of everything she's just been through. And from the sounds of things, takes that for the rest of her life, or at least until she eventually goes back to Troy after Menelaus dies. I did, that was a lot of talking. I did want to ask what you thought about Hermione and how that relationship resolved itself. You know what I'm going to say. 
She should have never left her in the first place. Disappointing. I don't care, like, anything that happens after. I'm just like, they can try to make it pretty. They can try to make it better. I- I'm like, no, no, no. You left her. You left her. And then because Helen was not written the right way, the way in which she should have been written, there's nothing that could redeem her. I mean, because I-, I always look at it from Hermione's perspective, where I'm like, well, if my mother came back and, and if, if if her answer to all my questions after like, you know, 10 years is, oh, well, I was really in love and I ran off and I thought you would be okay because, well, I, you know, my Spartan duty d- dictated I couldn't leave without a queen. I'd be like, fuck you too. Um, The only thing I'd want to hear if I'm Hermione is, oh, I... I'm so sorry. I never wanted to leave you. It turns out it was some nasty thing of the gods and I couldn't fight it. And that's why I left. But oh, wait, I'd never wanted to leave you in the first place ever. I love you so much. Like, please forgive me. This was totally not my doing. That would still be hard because like 10 years away from your daughter because you still left her. That sucks. But like, At least she'd be like, yes, I understand the gods are kind of cruel and like, okay, you didn't have a choice. You were promised to this prince and I suppose that means you had to go and what am I going to (laughs) do? Anything other than that. And I'm like, nah, uh -uh, eh, eh, wrong, wrong answer. So I was not impressed. I, so our Hermione's had slightly different I think writings because how Helen left differed in the first half of the book. Your Helen didn't ask Hermione to go with her. My Helen did. And Hermione said, no, no, no. And then fell back asleep again. So when Hermione says, why didn't you take me with you? Helen said, I asked and you said you didn't want to come. And Hermione's response was, I was nine. I didn't understand what you were asking me. Do you really think that's an appropriate excuse? So I liked that Hermione didn't pull any punches. I liked that she held Helen's feet to the fire. And ultimately, as a mother, I did like that they reconciled in the end. It made me feel better. Uh, It made you feel better. It did. She should never have left her in the first place. But But it was... But she did. I'm like, I mean, okay. Okay, put it this way. I know... Yes, in my version, they did reconcile. But... I'm just saying I'm very unhappy with the fact that they did because I know people are like, oh, no, no, we want mother and daughter to reconcile and be whole again. And I'm just like, bish, what you did. Whether it's my version where she was portrayed as unhappy and like left her because it was her duty or your version where she asked her, but she was l- nine and half asleep. I'm like, it doesn't matter. I'm like, honey. Whether mommy asked you when you were nine and asleep or left you because, no, Sparta needed a queen, I'm like, it should still be the same. You should be so fucking pissed that this woman left you because if if literally her answer was not, this was a a thing of the gods and I unwillingly left you no matter what the circumstances was. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, I don't feel Helen deserved the payoff. Like, she doesn't deserve it. Like... By, by her forgiving her. Oh, no, I, do, I do agree with you. The way it's written, she doesn't deserve it because she shouldn't have left her daughter. But no. she didn't I that. did feel as though... Yeah, she didn't earn that payoff. The payoff that she gets, while maybe undeserved, was hard won because it's, it's made pretty clear that this wasn't an overnight like thawing of Hermione. So Hermione's been married to Neoptolemus by this point. She's seen her aunt kill her uncle and now her cousin has has killed her aunt as well. She's been married. She's lost her husband. Her husband's dead. She's now back in her mother's house. No one else is going to marry her because there's all these curses surrounding her family. And she is rightfully angry and furious, somehow not bitter, which is amazing. Um, but when Helen shows up, she makes it very clear how angry she is. And that was, 
I appreciated that. It wasn't just a, oh, thank goodness you're home, I've missed you, or a, or a token, how could you leave me? Then two days later, they're having like tea and biscuits. It was a, I'm really mad at you. So mad. And then she tells her, like, who do you think discovered your mother, my grandmother, hanging from the rafters? It was me as a child because you left. All of this stuff happens to me as a child because you left. And I'm, I'm holding you accountable for that. I, I did feel like there was some level of accountability, maybe not as much as you would have preferred, but there was some. And then the relationship rebuilding is seems to be it. So you, you don't get a description of it because it really is only two chapters that covers all of this time. But it's a slow, gradual process. And I, the way I read it, it was as much a healing for Hermione as anything else, rather than giving Helen some kind of closure. Um, I might be reading into that. I don't know. But the, the nice bit is that Hermione does end up married with a child and seems happy when Helen leaves. So that was, I was glad that she had a good ending. I'm happy for Hermione that she had some kind of, some kind Something. of anything. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I just, you know, there, there's nothing more I hate when I feel that something's been unearned. And even though there was minor accountability, I'm still like, <laughs> honey. Not enough. This is so lacking. Uh, but But you know what? It's not even, like, that's just like a, a microcosm of my larger problems with, the, with you know, the way we're, we're always presented with, with Helen and her all of her relationships. They just, like, don't, they just don't make sense. They're either rushed and then she's suddenly, I love you, I'm happy, wait, I need to reconcile. Or she's like, ew, no, I don't like you. Like, like she's always very binary. I find her very black and white and... It's just like this is where we wanted all the shades of gray in between. And we don't get them. But you still get the payoff of like, well, not the payoff, but she's still sort of being written. It's being written in a way where I feel like it's they're, they're trying to make it where like she had m much more of this nuance and, 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 you know, complicated stuff. And you're like, yeah, but. But but she's not. So like, why are you giving her the space to have a whatever? You know, I don't know. Um, I I've said it often. I I don't like Helen, and I find it really regrettable that I don't like her because she had so much potential to be written in such an interesting way. I mean, you know, again, like last episode, if you if you take the I'm unwilling to stay but I'm also unwilling to go because of the God situation you know if she truly is like questioning she's like well I I know my feelings for Paris but otherwise I like my life and I miss my children and I miss being Queen of Sparta like I don't know you could have her like in Troy doing some shit behind the scenes being like like always like with an eye on how, how do I get back to Greece? How do I get back to my children? Like, what are, like, like, they could have her doing something, sort of. And then, you know, you could have Aphrodite coming in, and then you could have this, like, really dramatic, oh, no, she's trying to escape and go down to the Greeks. No, here comes Aphrodite being like, I am going to sail in and then poof you back into bed with, with you know, Paris because you're so infatuated. And, like, you know, in, in, in the book, in the real source material, it happens. Um, the, the duel with with Paris and, and Menelaus, you know, he's, like, about to lose. And then Aphrodite, she's like, poof! And then he, like, ends up magically in the marriage bed. And then they have sex. So that, does happen, that does happen in this one. And that's where they reconcile after after Troilus death but I do I do see where you're going with it and I do think there could have been more done with no. a regret an attempt to get back and then Helen trying to escape and constantly being put back by Aphrodite and she's just like well I don't I don't have a choice here I'm just gonna try and make the best of it right I mean yes it like I don't know it's just yeah I don't know there's there's you you see it here. You see it in the original source material. He he gets poofed back, and and 
in both versions, there's no attempt f- for her to fight it. She's like, okay. But I don't know. I just, like, I the gods are hard to include. Um, I, I get that. I know. The gods are, like, really freaking hard because they're either used as a plot device or they're just these, like, big, omnipotent beings just kind of benevolently, like, going around being like oh i see what's going on and then like not really doing anything until they feel like giving some divine inspiration or a little godly helping hand and you're like oh honey you could do so much more you could make them so much more that's the thing actually maybe maybe it's i've discovered as much as i hate gods being like cruel you need more, more cruel and more evil gods because then it makes the, the human dimension so much more tragic. And then you're like, ah, my problem is solved. If you're including the gods and you're using them for the reason for the war, you need to have them play a bigger role. I think you're right. I think that's that's one of the things that bothered me in the first half. And they play a slightly bigger role in the second, but not an awful lot. I mean, Persephone is named as one of Helen's protectors guardian deities she appears once and never again and i think especially if aphrodite had been a bigger more constant presence in helen's life and more obviously she's obviously cruel it it pops up at different points but if that cruelty and that presence were more consistent i think it would have made it would have made Helen leaving make a lot more sense and it would have made Helen staying make a lot more sense. I mean, the way the way they have it, I just feel like because it's not a constant thing, it just makes the gods look like randomly cruel. Uh, you know, so you're almost like, oh, is this a one-off? Because they did one like sort of bad thing and then you're like, and then they're okay now? Oh, no way. And then they're doing something bad again. Again? you know so i'm just like yeah it just it makes the gods seem even more schizophrenic than i think they need to be i think really just stick with like they're cruel all the time and it keeps i don't know if it came in in your came through in your version but athena keeps being named as either troy's protector but also achilles protector and helen makes several statements where she doesn't feel like Athena likes her very much. She doesn't trust Athena. But there's no presence of Athena. We don't, like, we, we never get Athena speaking for herself or to anybody else. And I think including that relationship would have been really, really helpful. And again, it, it rounds out the divine dimension. You've got uh, Aphrodite doing all this stuff at the end of the war Helen prays to Zeus and he acknowledges her as his daughter which was shocking but he essentially says he can't do anything having more of that interaction and having Athena involved and having Apollo I don't know involved I think would have made it a much stronger book and I think the motivations would have been easier to understand yes I mean that's the thing, though. We never hear of Athena. I mean, she is, yeah, supposedly the patron, a patron of the city. She's a patron. She's the patron of heroes. So why does the patron of heroes in a book jam-packed full of heroes so lacking in this this one person who, like, she is the, their, their goddess, their patron goddess? I mean, y- you know, you're like, oh, okay, well, she... Odysseus is one of the kings that she favors most, you know, one of her favorite humans. And yet she's not ever really portrayed, like, coming down to him and being, like, whispering, like, you know what you should do? You should make a horse. And then you should hide inside the horse. And then you should use it to play a trick and then go get into the city. Or even if we're, if we're sticking with Helen's viewpoint, uh, when the horse goes in, Helen goes out of the palace and imitates the voices of all of the Greek men's wives to try and get them to reveal themselves. That would have been a great point at which to have Helen, uh, to have Athena intervene and, I don't know, tell Helen she's not going to succeed or take away her voice or just something. And it, yeah, we just, we needed, we needed more gods, really. And, yeah. sorry, Apollo, 
when Hector dies, he says to Achilles, Paris and Apollo will kill you. Yes, great. And then we hear nothing about Apollo. And it's it's a minor point and it's not terribly important. But again, it's something that if Paris came home and told Helen about it, it would help round out this divine presence. And I think just be more satisfying for the reader. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, we know from source material, we know from mythology, we, we know which gods were on the side of the Greeks mainly. Um, and, and we know which gods mainly took the side of the Trojans. But it's funny because by reading a lot of these adaptations or watching the films, you really wouldn't know. I mean, like Artemis, Apollo, and Poseidon and Aphrodite were all technically siding with the Trojans. You never, you never hear of like any of them other than maybe Apollo because of the plague episode and Aphrodite because obviously. And then you're like, okay, so then what about the Greeks? And then you're like, ah, oh, yeah, well, obviously Hera and Athena play a pretty big role since they were scorned by Paris. So of course they're like, ah, oh, we're going to side with our Greeks. And you're like, but, but where's, where's Hera? respectfully where the fuck is Hera like she's... especially because at the beginning of the book Helen makes the point of saying that she scorned Hera yeah and yes you did have Hera react to it have her turn up like at that moment and then turn up later and yeah I I know it would have been complicated I know it would have been a whole other plot line to manage but it would have really helped I think yeah because that's the thing it's like you have certain story beats where because the gods have been written as such plot devices, like you, you, you really can't have something super coherent without them and have it make sense. And yet everyone and everything we've seen so far kind of avoids it. Like the only thing that came close was fall of a city um, because you saw at least a glimpse and then you have a reason you, you have Zeus and fall of the city kind of being like, no, we shall not interfere. And they're like, but father. And then he's like, no. And so you're like, okay, well, at least that kind of explains why they're not able to really interfere because you're like, okay, Zeus just laid the hammer down. said this is a purely like mortal issue. So now we're going to let the mortals handle it. And so I'm like, I didn't like it, but I was like, okay, you had them in there and it's hard and I get it. And then you still have those cool gems like Apollo you know reaching down and, and touching the Greek and then plague and you're like oh plague that's how it happened so like I, I just uh yeah I I I appreciated that fall of a city tried to go there but even they were like and and then because it's not even a book it's the screen you know it's like they have even less opera like like room to move about and play with that because it can't be super confusing i think i think fall of a city did it very well and i think they did have i think the screen thing was actually an advantage because you can do things like just show a god for seconds doing something and then it has all of these repercussions that's i think that's much more difficult to do with text i get i mean there's 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 um advantages to both mediums i think as we've seen um like as we've said with a book this size you could really get into the crunchy stuff of helen's psyche if if you wanted to and it would be you'd have the time the space would be justified things have to happen faster and they have to be more spelled out visually when you watch them because you only have if it's a movie you only have up to like you know two and a half hours or whatever um and if it, I mean, if it's a series, you get a bit longer, you get a couple, but like, it's like, it's like Fall of the City, it's, you know, like an hour and 15 minutes, but then you only get like 10 episodes. So, like, I get the limitations of each, but there's ways to get around it, and I, you know, Fall of the City came closest, but I still am like, I mean, I would have done it differently, but I get it. It's hard. You gotta establish the gods, and then you gotta make it visually understandable that they're not, like... A normal character because they're there but they're not seen they're invisible I, it, it, I don't know it's a whole thing and it just feeds back into my original issues with a lot a lot 
Um, and the thing is, it's like, that's what I kind of found brilliant. Oh, God, this is disgusting. How am I always going back to a thousand ships? I literally don't know how I always go back to that. Ah, God, I have I have a problem. For all that we, we like, Natalie, it, it's just a very well-written book. Yes. It really is. Because I'm like, yes, it's nonlinear. Yes, we have the gods in there. But at the same time, other than the chapter on the gods, she somehow had it where, like, she was able to explain kind of the effects on the women and what was happening to the characters and how their lives were affected by the gods without having to have the gods, like, explicitly there but it was very clear in her writing that all of these people all these women like had their lives heavily impacted by the nefarious actions of a god and so i'm like obviously she didn't it's not the type of book where she could really go into that but like the fact that hers isn't even trying to tell a linear story and yet you get more of a sense that all of her characters are seriously affected by the actions of gods when all these other adaptations that are telling a linear story like don't even make that super super spelled out i'm just like it you can tell you, you can tell the difference i don't know maybe i'm reading too much into a thousand ships but i i i love it so much that i see no wrong with it it's it is very good it is mm. um I did want to ask also what you thought of how Priam and Hecuba kind of developed as characters through the war. I mean, I, I want to be careful with what I say because I know that like I usually like Priam as a character i find him to be adequately tragic very much a man of you know oh no this bad shit is happening to my city and i'm very caring and i just want to like save my city and my family and you know like that's how he is and then i know in some adaptations we've had a like like almost equal partner hecuba right who's like his partner and they make all the decisions together and then in some other adaptations we have her being kind of like a snarky bitch basically right you know where we're like hecuba that you that you um yeah i don't i've seen so many versions of them at this point that i i i find myself genuinely confused as to which portrayal I like better because on the one hand I'm like I like the oh we're 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 partners and we kind of have disagreements but we'll work through it together and 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 we can do it for our city and our family whatever and I'm like okay that tracks it tracks in certain situations I'm like okay it tracks um because that's because uh, I feel like that's a normal human reaction, right? Like, you've you got some shit going on, and... Okay, maybe you're not supportive of everything, but, like, you're like, okay, well, there's a larger purpose, and we care about the same things, and we have family, and we want to defend that, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll get on board. And then at the same time, I'm like, but it's more exciting when they disagree a lot, um, you know, and... <sighs> And it also kind of tracks, right? Like, if she's kind of being bitchy about the whole thing, because she also has that great valid lane of, well, you let Helen stay. You could have put her on a ship and, like, made her leave. I mean, I don't know if that would have done anything, but it would have, like, demonstrated, you know, that he has some backbone of being like, no, I'm not even going to let the Greeks try to come to my city and argue over her. So, I don't know. It tracks both ways. I, I, so this version just made me even more confused because I'm like, I don't know where I stand anymore because I I don't know. I was going to say, do, did you end up figuring out, do you like when they're together, like stand together on things or do you like more when they're like, when she's kind of a bitch, basically? I like everything. I like, I, I like you, I enjoy both um, depictions. I think what really struck me 
with this book and because it's such a big book it's sorry it's 650 pages it's a long book it gives margaret george i think the space to develop the trojan royal family dynamic in a way that i have i don't think we've seen in as much detail before so obviously you have cassandra doing her doomsaying thing but you get a lot more of all of the other brothers and some of the sisters popping through and being more rounded characters and more active participants in the story and the the way that impacts i think prime and hecuba and i think the reason is that as each child is killed starting with troilus and going on as each child is killed everyone just collapses in on themselves just a little bit more and i think it's most obvious with prime and hecuba because obviously they're their parents but because they're also the king and queen they have to be like bright and happy and yes we're going to win this war and that's how they start out but as it goes on and as they lose more and more and more children it's almost as though not necessarily that, well no they i think they do stop caring when hector dies and something that has that pops up through the book once helen is tro is in troy is like the, the jockeying of position of the brothers for not for next in line to the throne because that's always hector until he dies but like relative position within the family so then when hector does die and suddenly there's heir to the throne space open up the brothers kind of there's a little bit of a competition to see who can get prime's favor and who steps up in ways that he appreciates more but it takes a while for priam and hecuba to kind of come out of the grief of losing hector and realize actually we do have other children and it takes paris growing some balls and yelling at them and saying you have another son you have i mean if we're being honest they have several other sons but you have another son you've never been thrilled about my existence you tried to kill me well fine i'm done with you and then he storms out and that is kind of the kick that they both need to say actually okay sorry you're right we didn't see your like princely sunnish potential before now but uh, you should definitely come and be heir to the throne but the way that they retreated and um, retreated a little bit more with each death i thought was very very well done and, and relatively subtle it was it was a really good way to write the family unit as a whole without having to give each member the same amount of of story and the same amount of pages which would have taken a book twice this long because it's a very large family i mean i was well i guess it tracks with this version since it includes all those things that you don't normally see on other adaptations i mean yes there were a lot of children of prime and hecuba but hector was always he was always seen as the favorite like we knew that they knew that he was the golden boy the golden child and yeah like most adaptations kind of have them outside of the brad pitt troy almost all adaptations yeah they're like kind of leery of paris at first and they don't really band around him so i'm like it's not surprising but i don't know yeah i i feel like that's something that this adaptation has in common with fall of a city because once hector dies paris sort of steps up and comes into his own in terms of commanding the army and being like most favored son kind of thing uh even though dephobus has been hanging out waiting for that to be his chance paris really does fill that role um yeah i mean is it any wonder why though i mean like you know he's kind of like well i'm the reason hector's oh, dead. i brought the war so i mean he has so much guilt that like it does track like with the with the like psychological effects of Hef hector's death you know they lost the, the warrior they were kind of like well once hector went it, it's like the writing is kind of on the wall like he was the best of the trojans so the city's probably not gonna be like you know survive and um y you know i would see it as yeah he's like doing his part but also then you bring in the like 
lost, forgotten child type of guilt where you're like, oh no, I need to prove myself twice as much because I wasn't raised here. You know, I was taken out of the city. I was raised, you know, as a shepherd. And like, um, you do have that kind of guilt where you're like, okay, but now that my brother's gone, I have to really step up because he's like, this, this is all on me. And I have to prove myself twice as hard. So, so like it, it, it tracks that, that part tracks. Um, and it's funny that I'm like, you annoy, you, you, they like ignore so much psychologically of so many things and so many things don't track. But the fact that they got this like one part, right. I'm like, okay, interesting. I don't know. Um, but I, I, I like the, well, the, the dual recession of Prime and Hecuba, it's interesting. You know, it's one of the, the adaptations that kind of adheres closer to the, they, they band together more than Hecuba's just a straight up bitch. And yeah, you lose your favorite son and I could see you receding together. That yeah. tracks as well. But I almost would have preferred... I think in this version, I think I would have preferred uh, her to have a little more fire where, you know, if Prime's, like, devastated because his son is gone, and then you have a bitch Hecuba not receding and being like, bitch, we need yeah, yeah. we need revenge. You know, like, this is the time where, like, like it almost would have been like, oh, well, if she was a bitch about everything, she could have done so much. Like, she could have pushed Paris to step up and be like, you know, she could have been like, it's your fault your brother's dead, so now you have to step up. Um, so it could have gone that way as well. Um, I don't know. There, there's there's a lot of ways you can go if you have bitch Hecuba, not p- partner in sync Hecuba, who just kind of mimics everything that Prime does and vice versa. Um, so again, um, we, we've seen a lot of versions of them. So, uh, you know, um, yeah, I, f- I'm fine with their development, but they could have gone the other way too. And it would have been just as bad. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. So we should probably, I have, I'm sure, 8 million things more to say about this book because it is so large and so detailed. But we have some things to talk about for the rest of this season. So before we get to that, would you recommend this as a novel for someone? I would because it's the only thing we really have from written directly from Helen's perspective and if you're like us and you just want to go on like an obscenely big reading odyssey where you're like I just want every single possible angle of the Trojan War I think it's impossible to ignore the person who is basically blamed and the catalyst I you know so I would recommend it I mean I don't again we've now well noted our difficulties and why I personally am like, I really just, (laughs) this is such a missed opportunity, but like, it's better than nothing. And I'd rather have something tangentially from her perspective than nothing, because it does kind of fit a missing piece to the narrative puzzle. It does fill in some blanks. And, and I do like how it includes a lot of things that are canonically true that you just wouldn't see um, in other adaptations. Cause I think Helen of Troy was the only other one that had the canonical stuff, like the kidnapping by Theseus and her, you know, brother, Pol- you know, Pollux and whatever. Um, so, and, and her marrying Diophobus after, like, so these canonically true things are ignored in a lot of things because it doesn't serve the greater purpose of you're just trying to tell the story of the Trojan War. And this is about so much more than just the Trojan War. This is about Helen, the person, her history and the aftermath. So, I would say it's probably one of the more comprehensive ones that is canonically true. And it is at least an entertaining read because you can tell Margaret George did her research a a lot about Greece. Honestly, like the, the, the detail that she goes into like describing life in, you know, Mycenae and Greece, like it's, it's actually really good. So, um, yeah, there's always things I'm not going to like, but definitely would recommend. What about you? Yeah, I I would. I ha- um, growing up read a lot of fantasy novels. I am a real sucker for immersive worlds and big sweeping storylines, and this has both of those things. It's very well researched, like you said, 
while I am not a huge fan of Helen or her motivations, I think the characters, generally speaking, are very well rounded. The inter interpersonal relationships are very well done. And it's, it's, yeah, immersive really is the word for it for me. So, yes, absolutely. For all the problems we have with it, I think it is a good book. I, I did. I enjoyed the second half more than the first, but I did enjoy it. I, I agree in the second half, at least. I mean, it doesn't really save it because, well, we know. But, <laughs> but yes, it's more. The second half is more enjoyable. But, um, I think it'll it'll be the place to go for Helen's perspective until we get our ghostwriter and write the version we want to see. Perfect. So this actually wraps us up for the Trojan for the Iliad, the Trojan side of things. I have enjoyed it very much. We'll do, I'm sure, a wrap-up episode right at the very end of the series. We're going to take a couple of weeks break because we need a couple of weeks to prepare the rest of the season. And we're going to kick off the second half of the season looking at the Odyssey with a live recording, not of a book or a movie, but Lexi and I are doing some playthrough of Assassin's Creed Odyssey because there is a nice set of storylines connected to... Homer's Odyssey. So we're going to do that. And that's going to be part of the Hit Points and History Conference, which is a completely virtual Archeo Gaming Conference that Lexi and I are proud to be involved in organizing. The website, if you want more information, is hitpointscon.com. It's like, what, $9 per person for a ticket. So if you fancy coming and seeing a live recording and chatting with Lexi and I, you can absolutely do that. We won't have a uh, time for our recording. The conference itself is 4th and 5th of March. So it will be one of those days. And if you check the website at some point, there will be a schedule posted. So you'll be able to work out when. And I'll put an announcement on the YouTube channel as well. But that will be fun. Please come and join us because it will be I'm going to enjoy it anyway. I'm going to enjoy it because I can't wait to start our Odyssey stuff. I have I will definitely be up front and say that traditionally, the Iliad out of the two epics has always been my favorite. And This is perfect because the Odyssey has always been mine. Oh, see, I, and it's funny because I'm like after reading how many different and watching how many different uh, adaptations of the Iliad, I'm kind of like, I always kind of get that. Is it still my favorite? Because now I'm like tearing this apart bit by bit by every single possible angle. And I'm like, it's so problematic. But you know what? Maybe my opinion will change. And I'm sure we'll hear, you know, in the wrap up, whether our opinions of these things have changed after the whole season. But from what I can say, after all these adaptations, I found so much more nuance in the story. And like things just get make more sense. So... I actually think I might love the Iliad even more after like 10, 11, 12 adaptations. I don't know. It's possible. I think I've definitely gained a new appreciation for it. Yeah. And I know I can, I can definitely say what I do and don't like very clearly in a way that I never was able to. And we've just dug into so much. Um, and I feel like I know some of the characters better. Um, I understand their motivation or lack thereof or why they might have been forced to do stuff. So I'm really excited about getting into that for the Odyssey because it is traditionally something that I would read it for school, but I didn't have to read it as often as the Iliad. And therefore, I just was like, eh, I don't need to. It's fine. So, yeah, I would say going into the second half of our season, I'm really excited because... I haven't really, you know, I haven't read the Odyssey itself in a really long time. So I feel like I need to brush up a little bit on, on what happened so I can make sure I, I know exactly what's happening. But um, I'm really excited to get to it. We're finally going to get to the man of twists and turns. Um, our, you know, our boy, our boy Odysseus. So um, I don't know. Before we wrap up, is there anything you're particularly like super excited about coming up in the Odyssey? It's a good question. I always enjoy the, like, just the wild monsters and fantastical episodes, which coming from someone who loves fantasy novels, that's probably not a terrible surprise. So I'm looking forward to that. I um, always enjoy Cersei. So seeing some depictions of her will be wonderful. And I think we also have um, a similar novel to Helen of Troy. I think we have one from Penelope 
right at the end of our list. So that I am definitely going to enjoy very much because again, like Helen, you don't hear an awful lot from Penelope, but it will be fun. The Forgotten mm -hmm. Women. Um, I guess for now, before we do a full season wrap up, do you have any final thoughts on our entire Iliad? The, our odyssey through the Iliad. <laughs> <laughs> I think my main thought is how much I've enjoyed it. I did, I did think, I can't remember how many versions we've covered, at least 10. I did think I would get a little bit tired by the end. But I've really enjoyed each and every adaptation, even the ones that I've had issues with. And I think there are an awful lot of really creative people using and reusing mythology in ways that I would never think of, and in ways that I think really do make me appreciate the original source material more than I did previously. Do you have any? I kind of agree with you there. And all I'll say is, like, like I'm a bit sad that we're finishing this unit because, again, I thought I'd be kind of really tired of it. Like, oh my God, we're, we're you know, beating a dead horse at this point. But the fact that so many different creatives have found such different ways to make me not get bored of it is quite a feat because, you know, usually people take their time between adaptations and read something else or do something else. Um, I, I really haven't had time for that. So no, it's been really fun that uh, what I've been reading is the same kind of story told through different lenses. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of sad that we're ending, but I'm really happy to also be moving on to part two um, but you know what? It's left me with an overwhelming urge to want to reread the Iliad itself because, like, you, like, like we're getting the same story. But I'm like, I now I just I feel like I need to compare it with the poetry, of the original, right? Yeah. So I don't know. Will this make you want to go read the Iliad itself again? I think so. I I do think so. And I haven't read anything non Iliad related for. When did we start this? We started recording about six months ago. Yeah, and like... I read anything in Iliad for a long time, but I do think I want to go and reread the original just, just once. Yeah. Oh my God, maybe we should do that at the end of the season. Uh, if we have... Yes. I don't know. Yes. Uh, we might just be like, okay, now I'm really homered out after, you know, like 10 adaptations of each, we might be like, no, no, no. But um, that could be fun. You know so anyway keep you all posted thanks for joining us through the first half of our season we are going to be well trying to rest and recharge but also prepare the whole second half of the season for you guys so come join us for our live recording we will be so happy and excited to have you all join us and um yeah get ready for an exciting Part two of season one. Woo! All right. Bye. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a review. And you can also follow us on social media at the Reading Party Podcast. If you'd like to leave us a book or movie suggestion, then email us at the Reading Party Pod at gmail.com. See you next week. Mm -hmm.